Well, good morning. It is morning. Sunday. What's the date? The 26th? 26th. Yes. Sunday, the 26th of April. And uh, we're broadcasting live. And uh, we'll be here again Wednesday at 7. You can join us if you want. We'll watch us live at home. And uh, we'll be doing that until further notice. But uh, there will be no Sunday evening services. We typically don't have a Sunday evening service all summer, so we're just starting that a month earlier. And so there won't be a Sunday evening service until August. So we've got to remember that. Uh, but 10, 10 30 Sunday mornings and uh, 7 o'clock Wednesdays, we'll be broadcasting live. You can watch us each time, or you can come here and join us as the auditorium is open. And we've got about oh, 23, 25 people, something like that, every day. Um, I'll be preaching a little bit later on on Give God Your Best. But first, we're going to sing some songs, and I'll ask Floyd and Ethan if they'll lead us. And so if you have a hymnal with you, it's 619, 619, and we're saying stand up, stand up for Jesus. And you'll notice in the hymnal, 618 and 619 are the same title of the song, but we're going to be singing the melody of 619, okay, not 618. So when they're ready, they'll start, and I'll sit over here and uh, sing.
closing the service with a song. So we'll take care of that then. But for right now, if you have your hand out and uh, you have your Bible, we're going to take a look at Give God Your Best. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll start. Dear Lord God, we thank you again for your care upon us and for us. We thank you for allowing us to be here and getting those folks out here that can come, those who are watching uh, in, in the distance. Pray, Lord, that you be with them also. Help us, Lord, to study your word and understand it, apply it in our lives so that we can serve you properly. For the name of Christ I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, when we take a look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 18, if you want to turn your Bible there, you can. Galatians 4 18. And this will be kind of a start off verse for us. And this is what it says. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. So the Apostle Paul is writing the church of Galatians. He says, it's always good to have on your heart and in your mind doing what the good thing is. Now, look at me and understand this. When Paul uses the word good, he's using a specific Greek word. And the specific Greek word means that which is godly. So don't misunderstand. I'm just doing something that's nice. I'm not just you know making my bed and walking with a little lady across the street. All oh, those are nice things. They're good things. He's talking about the godly things. It's good to be zealously affected always in a godly thing. And for each of us, the godly thing may be a little bit different. Specifically, generally speaking. We're to do things similar as children of God, but specifically, what is it that God wants you to do? Now, if God calls you to be a fisherman, then be a fisherman and fish for God. If he calls you to be a doctor, be a doctor, but be a doctor for God. God called me to teach school for a while, then he called me to be a pastor. I'm, I'm going to try to do the right thing in those, in those areas. I'm not going to try to be the best mechanic I can be, per se, because... I'm always eating the can. I open my toolbox, and there's 37 three quarter inch full pen wrenches. Why do I got 37 of them and nothing of any other size? Where did they all come from? Where did the other ones go? I have no clue. Well, I'm not mechanical. But God told me to teach school, He told me to be a pastor. What did God tell you to do? Be zealous on fire for that thing. Hey. All right? That's the start. So now we're going to give God a rest because in whatever it is that God called me to do, whatever God called you to do, you're going to be on fire to do it. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look here. Just a couple of things and I will try to be quick for you. First of all, serve God. If you're going to be zealous of a good thing, what's the first thing you should do? Serve God. He gave you something. Do something with it. Serve Him. Don't just be, I'll use myself again this example, don't just be a good teacher so that I get the promotion or I get the raise or the kids learn. All that stuff is fine and peachy. But I'm doing this because it's what God wants me to do. My teaching for God. Now that's something you look. Am I bagging groceries for God? Am I a bank teller for God? Am I washing cars or scrubbing floors for God? That's what you look at. What's it say in Matthew chapter 6? Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, don't take any thought of your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Life is more than food and raiment. And yet, in our lives, what do we typically think about? I have my job to get my money so I can pay my bills and have some food and get some clothes and have a vacation and have a good Christmas. None of that is in and of itself wrong or evil. But if that's your goal, it is wrong for you. Don't go to work, the Bible tells the book of Proverbs. Don't labor to be rich. Stop thinking like that. And I know I say it often, and I don't want it to be trite, but look at me. God paves his streets with gold. Amen. He knows what you want, and he knows what you need. And if you will serve him, he will take care of you. He promises that. So don't go to work thinking, i got to have more money. I have to go to work on God. Maybe there's somebody at work that God wants me to talk to. Maybe some person at the, uh, they're my work fellow, or the place that some um, a bank teller or a grocery clerk, and they're going to come through my line. I'm going to get a flat tire and end up in the tire.
your store, getting it. And I'm supposed to talk to that person. What does God want me to do? Okay? Don't think about what is this job going to give me. Don't think like that. Serve God. Number two, very simple and very similar, consider God. What we're going to take a look at in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, the next verse. Look, consider the fowls of the earth. Look at the birds. They don't go out and plow the fields and disc the fields and spring tooth the fields and put the rows in and plant the seed. They don't do that. Neither do they go out with the harvester or the combine and reap the field. Nor do they don't go in and stack all the feed sacks and hay miles. They, they don't store it. Yet, your Heavenly Father takes care of them. Aren't you better than a bird? It's a rhetorical question. Now, for all of those of you who are animal lovers and all that, please don't take this wrong. You are better than an animal because you're not an animal. Amen. You are made in the image of God. That's right. Amen. The Bible tells us quite clearly that God put Adam in the Garden of Eden and he said, Now, you take care of this. So if I believe that we should go out and just chop all the trees down and put a black top everywhere and destroy the environment. No! Not at all. We are to use the earth in such a way that it benefits everything that can be benefited. Okay? So a true biblical position on environmentalism is don't go to some extreme in either direction. Mm -hmm. Can I use this to better us? To make life easier on us? To honor God? When I plant my crop, when I water my crop, when I harvest my crop, when I sow my crop, am I doing it for God? How am I doing it? So let's take a look here. He goes on in verse 28. Look at the flowers. Look at the lilies in the field. They grow, but they don't toil. Neither do they spin. Okay, so we're talking about, he says lilies, but he says, look at the, a better illustration here. Look at the flax. The flax is what we get linen from. Look at the cotton. That's where we get cotton cloth from. You never go out in the field and see cotton plants or flax with spinning wheels making their own cloth. They don't toil, they don't spin. Yet I'm telling you, the most beautiful garment you can get out of that flax linen or that cotton material, the most beautiful outfit you can get has no comparison to what the beauty of nature is. Look what God has done. He takes care of them. So am I going to consider God? I cannot serve God if I'm not considering him. Mm -hmm. I can't serve my boss if I don't consider what he's trying to do. Get you know, the same mindset. There's got to be the word that you say is synergy. What's that mean? All of our brains have to be thinking about the same old, old fashioned word. Okay, ready? Get this one all of you old enough to do it. Not synergy, it's mind me. <laughs> get your mind on my mind. Think like me. God says, think, consider me. Before you do anything, they will serve me. Number three, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to consider God. Number three, I'm going to rely on God. Now, again, up in my yard, I've got oh, four, five, six tomato plants, a couple, couple plants growing in these pots. I love it. I love growing stuff. I wish I had a big garden, but I don't. I've got some pots. I'll ask you this question How much do I personally have to do with how? The tomato seed germinates and grows. <clears throat> well, I can stick it in the ground. I can water it. I can <clears throat> fertilize it. But I have nothing to do with this germination genetically or physically. Mm -hmm. All I can do is prepare the soil. So in your life, can you prepare your soil to produce what it needs to produce? Okay, if you can, then don't junk up your soil. Prepare it. Mm. And rely on God. Well, listen, the seed germinating and the root going down, I don't know if you remember in science class, you ever had those things where you put the seeds in a petri dish on a wet cloth, and it goes around real slow, the seed roots stretch the seeds, and the sprout are going to go. Mm -hmm. And they will always go the right direction. When you stop it, they'll turn. That's it. Seeds go down, the roots go down, and the plant goes up. As soon as you're done, you wait till they germinate and you stop the wheel, and they'll all turn and go the right direction. How does the seed know which way is up and down? Well, it's a gravitational thing. Come on. It's a seed. How does it know about gravity? You see flowers turn toward the sun. 
God designed that in them. In your life, when you prepare the soil of your life, rely on God. Look at me. You cannot prepare the soil and then make the stuff grow. Mm -hmm. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. The fruit of the Spirit cannot grow well in unprepared soil. Mm -hmm. When Jesus said, he cast the seed out, the word, and some was on stony ground, and some was on hard ground, and some was on good ground. Prepare the soil. So rely on God to do the work. What did Jesus say? I'll do it for you if you'll just let me. So rely on God. Number four. Seek God. Verse, 20, verse 33. Matthew 6, 33. Seek God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The way he sees what's right. Not the way you think it is. Okay? Don't look at life the way you think it should be. Look at life the way God says it is. Because see, truth is not truth because you agree with it. Truth is truth whether you understand and agree with it or not. Amen. Okay? So, seek the kingdom of God first. What is God doing? Now, we can use this to talk about the actual coming kingdom, or we can look at it in a generic sense. Look at, in God's overall plan, what's he going to do? What does he want to do? What has he told us to do collectively? What has he told you to do specifically? I'm going to seek that first. So I gave the illustration some time ago. I don't think I've said it for a while, so here you go. One time I was teaching a Sunday school class back in Michigan. My Sunday, my Sunday school class was in the gymnasium. And there was 110 adults in my Sunday school class. And I was, I was teaching my Sunday school lesson. I got my notes and I was just clicking along and wasn't missing a beat. But in the back of my mind, because during the week, five, six days a week, I was an athletic director for our school and for the state association. I ran all the tournaments for the state. And in the back of my mind, as I'm going through and I'm not missing a beat on my Sunday school lesson, I'm thinking about the tournament and who's where and did I get the reps. And my brain was thinking about something my mouth was saying something completely different. And I was going home that day from church. After some school to church, I'm going home and I'm thinking, Something's wrong. That's starting to control my very life. My wife said, yeah, it happened long before that Sunday. I said, went, went to work in the next couple of weeks, went to my boss, and it happened to be my dad, and I said, I'm going to stop doing athletics. I cannot let it control my thought when I'm supposed to be teaching a lesson. Mm. There was nothing wrong with athletics, but it was starting to consume me. Seek the kingdom of God first. Seek the kingdom of God first. Mm. Next point, point E. So we serve God, we consider, we rely, we seek. Now, remember God. Mm. Now, remember doesn't mean, oh yeah, that happened. Well, no. Keep him on your mind constantly. There's nothing in your life that doesn't have something to do with your relationship with God. Your relationship with God affects everything in your life. So remember God. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Okay? So we're going to be in Proverbs now. We were in Matthew 6 for the first couple. Now we're in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, don't forget my law. Let that law be in your heart. Keep my commandments. David says, keep them in your heart. Don't just have a list stuck up on the refrigerator and check it off. Yeah, I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. No, in your heart, are these things real to you? Well, I went to church and I, I figured out my tithe and I gave 10% right down to the fraction of the penny and I rounded it off because I'm good. That's, no, 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 no. In your heart, I challenge you, look at the Bible and Look up the places where the Bible says, I will write my law on the heart. Amen. Mm -hmm. It has to be on the heart. Mm -hmm. When you're driving down the road, are you always thinking what the speed limit is, or are you doing what you know you ought to do? Not what you want to do. When you're driving through a subdivision, what's the, what's the general speed limit? 30 miles an hour. When you go to drive a train, I call drive a train, what is the speed limit on the law? Of driving through. If there's houses with their driveways coming out the street, how fast are you supposed to go? 20, 25 at the most. 
So if I see the thing that says 30, <laughs> I can do 30 and not get a ticket. But if I don't see any sign anywhere, you know what you should be doing? I make no five. Well, back where I live, it's 30. But the rule of thumb is there's driveways coming out, there's kids going to run out the street. Slow down. So should we have that on our hearts? Yes. Because, you know, when you hit a kid with your car, the car always wins. And you can't undo it. So you put that in a spiritual perspective. Okay? Do what is right. Have it in your heart. Look what it says. My son, don't forget my law. Keep my commandments. Why? Look at verse 2. Length of days, long life, and peace they will give you. Hmm. You want to have a long, happy, peaceful life? Let God's rules be on your heart. Amen. Be thinking about him. Be remembering him. Be serving him. Be considering him. Let that be personal mm -hmm. in your life. So you will find favor and good understanding in the sight of both God and man. Now somebody might call you a holy roller and think you're all goofy and, and mock you because you're a Christian. But they will respect you for being a decent person. And that will leave an opening for testimony for why you are. Number F, letter F. Trust God. Look at Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Mm -hmm. Stop thinking you can figure it out. Okay, I'm going to use me as an illustration, and I'll, I'm going to brag mockingly. This is it. This is Okay. I went to college. I spent four years in college. I needed 136 credits or something like that to graduate. I had close to, it was more than 200 when I graduated. So I'm brilliant. I passed. I had a, overall a B average or something like that. Oh, I had my IQ checked, and I'm up in 132, 33 range. I'm brilliant. Boy, you guys are just... Wait a second. Wait a second. There's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that I can say. There's nothing that I have achieved that can beat what God can tell you to do. Mm. Amen. Mm. Trust Him. If you're trusting me, you're an idiot. It's not smart to trust me. Ask my wife, honey, have I ever done something that was stupid, wrong, and dumb? Yes. So don't do that. So the Apostle Paul says, I'm going to paraphrase him, he says, when you see me following Christ, get in line. But when you see me veering from Christ, have nothing to do with me. I'll tell you the same. If you see me doing something for God, help, join in. If you see me doing something dumb, get away from me. How do you know whether it's godly or stupid? You have to be on call. You've got to have stuff. You've got to have a relationship with God. You understand? Those who blindly follow some leader are people who aren't thinking for themselves based on what God has already said. So check it out. The believers, the Christians in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they came to church with readiness of mind, and daily search the scriptures to see whether Paul was telling them the truth. And Paul says, check me out, I want you to, that's good. So, trust God in all your ways. Stop thinking you can figure it out yourself. Letter G, acknowledge God. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, He will direct your paths. So when I'm trusting God, and this is very interesting, to trust and to acknowledge are really two different things. You trust me, and so I say, let's do something, and then you won't do it, but what I said. You're not acknowledging that you trust me. The acknowledgement is the manifestation of the trust. Okay? That's why faith is an action word. You can believe faith-wise, I believe, I believe, I believe, but until you jump out of the plane and pull the ripcord, your faith is dead. It doesn't do anything. You don't, tr you don't trust it until you use it. So trust God, but then acknowledge what? He knows what's best for you. He knows what's best for me. And again, back in 1978 when I graduated from college, I never thought in a million years I would be a pastor anywhere. It wasn't on my list of things to do. Back in 2005, when Jim Ben asked me if I could come and preach here on Easter Sunday because I was in Florida from California. I was here for a vacation. Can you come? And I came. I thought, okay, I can fill it. I thought some
Catholic school before. I can, I can do a, an Easter service. And then they asked me, y'all asked me to come back on Sunday night. I, I wasn't planning on coming back Sunday night. <laughs> then you asked me to come back on Wednesday night. Okay. Then you asked me to come and be the pastor. I asked God, God says, yeah, that's where I want you. Okay, then I will go. Will you acknowledge that God knows what he's talking about, and he's got your best interest in mind? Yes, I'll do that. Okay? So acknowledge him in all your ways. Let him direct your path. Letter H, respect God. Look what it says in verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear, respect God. Depart from your thinking from evil. It shall be healthy to your navel and narrow to your bones. Respect God. When God then, because you are trusting God, you're acknowledging that God wants you to do. But look at me. How many times have you looked, think back in your life, if you're older, you're younger, you said, your parents told you to do something, and you still didn't do it? Well, I respect God. I, I, trust, him. I trust him. I'll acknowledge that he knows what he's talking about, but I'm not going to do that. No. Respect what he says because I trust him and I acknowledge him. I will actually do what he said. Notice the steps in this. I respect that he's God. I acknowledge that he knows the best. But I don't follow the way. Don't be that way. You should respect him. Do what he says, where he says, how he says, when he says, for as long as he says to do it. Remember this. If it's not immediate, it's not obedience. If you're told to do something right now, and you do it five weeks from now, did you finally obey? Yes, but what about the five weeks you didn't do it? <laughs> you were in disobedience for five weeks. Repent, confess that, tell God you're sorry, tell him you made a mistake, please be merciful to me, show me what to do. Read between the lines if you want, just as an illustration. What would have happened if uh, Noah didn't build the ark? What if he had waited 120 years before he started? Would God have brought the rescue some other way? Yep. But Noah would never be mentioned in the Bible as a guy who will leave God. When God called Moses to lead the people out of Egypt, Moses gave five excuses. And finally, Moses said, okay, but what if Moses had said, no, I'm not going to do it? Would they have still come out of Egypt? Yep. But Charles and Justin could have never been Moses. <laughs> Is God's will going to get done with or without you? Yes. Then feel honored when God says, would you like to be part of it? Mm -hmm. And then do it. Respect what he tells you to do. Number I. Honor God. Look what it says here in verse 9. Proverbs 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of thy increase. If you do that, if you honor God with your substance and with your first fruits, your barns will be filled and your presses will burst up with new wine. What does God say? Do you want to have, in this context, earthly social success? It doesn't mean you're going to be the rich guy. But it means God will take care of you. You're going, to, you're going to have a good crop. You're going to be able to have what you need. Based on what? Well, I honor God with my first fruits. Now, this is referring to a law that was given to the Jewish people, but the principle applies to us. We often talk about, in most churches, we talk about tithe and offering. I generally don't talk about tithes, because tithe was a Hebrew law. But tithe existed before the law. And tithe means 10%. But in the New Testament, in the church age, as we often call it, what does the Bible emphasize? Offering. You're not required by law to give 10% as a New Testament Christian. You're, you're required in the New Testament to love God so much that you give out of your heart. That's why in Micah, the book of Micah, where it says, you have robbed me. How have we robbed you? In your legally required tithe, and in your frequent offerings. You're withholding what's legally required, but I also am not giving your heart. Mm -hmm. I'll ask
ask all these husbands because I'm a guy who ask husbands. But it's birthday, anniversary, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, all that kind of stuff. How can you express to your wife that you appreciate and love and respect her? You get flowers. You get her a card and some candy and a stuffed bear and some flowers and you take her out to the steakhouse. Why do we do those kind of things? We actually spend money that I could have bought on another company. <laughs> I could have bought another power trip. I could have, but I still don't hurt. Why? Because love produces generosity. You know how much you love God? How generous are you with Him? You know how much you love your husband, your wife, your kids? How generous are you with Him? We were at the store the other day, my wife and I, bought from the Target because we had to get milk, bread, and heavy whipping cream. That's what we went there for. When we came out, we had pajamas for one grandchild and a little couple of dresses for another grandchild. I found out later that one of the grandchild, it was their birthday. <laughs> I wasn't getting it because it was her birthday. I was getting it it was there. And I love my grandkids. I know it's like reading. When I walk into a store and I see stuff, I think, oh, you like that, she like that, they like it. And I get it. Why? Because I love them. If you walk into the store and say, well, I get it. Okay, I've got to spend at least $10. That ain't love. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying blow your budget. But love doesn't sit around saying, how cheap can I be? <laughs> God loved us so much, he sent his own son to die for us. Amen. Amen. Got that kind of love. Okay? Honor God with thy substance. What do I have that can promote the cause of God? Okay? Stupid illustration, I'll move on to the last point. Five years ago, or whatever it was, six years ago, I can't remember. I left most of my brain on the side of the road. <laughs> my timeline was completely off. But five years ago, something like that, Brian and Melissa played the piano, played the choir and stuff. They got transferred out to Texas and Arizona or whatever. But they got transferred to New York and Ohio. And so, about a year after they left, my wife and I went to each other and said, let's buy some guitars and run out of play. At least we'll have some music. So we did. We practiced some Christmas songs as we get about that time of the year. Come with my daughter. Floyd and Ethan, they want to play too. Floyd knows how Ethan's running. So okay. then, then Bob came in from one of our snowboards. He plays too. Then Luke picked up the guitar. And he went, and then Amanda, she's in the army. She called God. She's playing the ukulele. What, what are we going to do with what we got? Mm -hmm. You can always do something with your substance. With your first fruits. What are you going to give to God first? Okay? Lastly, letter J. That's sign on Grace Curve. For all you she's watching, okay? Glorify God. When it's all said and done, all these points before this, why is it you're doing what you're doing? What's your motivation? My dad used to say all the time, Look, check the motives, boys. Check the motives, guys. Why? Not what you're, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Are you doing this to glorify God? If you're not, stop. Now, will we all, every now and then, slip into the I'm doing it for me mentality? We will. Catch yourself. I'm not supposed to be doing this just for me. Now, what I'm doing to glorify God might help me in, in this generic sense. It will help me. You don't know what God wants, he'll bless you. Mm -hmm. But if I'm doing it and I'm not thinking, I'm not considering, I'm not remembering, I'm not trusting God, wait, do whatever you're doing to honor God, to glorify God. Look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, 2 and 3, very familiar verses. Whether therefore you eat or drink, how many of you so far today have had something to eat, something to drink? Mm -hmm. I've had something to drink, I haven't eaten anything yet. I plan to uh, fix that problem <laughs> as soon as I can. So, so eating and drinking is something we do every day. But whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, cut the grass, change the tire, fly on the kite, whatever you're doing, do it to glorify God. How in the world can I trim my hedge 
we glorify God. Well, I got cocoa plums all around my backyard. They need to be shared every now and then. They take over. We don't have a command that God has given us. Thank you for letting me have this house. Lord, thank you for letting me have this yard. Lord, thank you for letting me find an affordable pair of electric hedge trimmers. <laughs> Amen. Let me cut this. Thank you, Lord, for helping me not cut through my cord. <laughs> Can you glorify God when you're doing whatever you're doing? Mm -hmm. At our house right now, we're having a problem with our septic deal. So every day, the six of us that live there, we go over to Micah's house or Dave's house or whatever, take our showers, do our laundry. We've been doing that for a while. Yesterday evening, about 6.30, a guy came over that we've been trying to get a hold for a month. He's Man, I'm busy all the time, but I can fix this. I'll be here as soon as I can. Okay. Can I glorify by God that I can't use my bathroom and take a shower there? I have to wash dishes. My wife does not want Wash dishes in a bucket and catch the water in the sink and then go dump it out. Can we glorify God about that? Hey, my air conditioner's for us. I got a roof over my head and I got a little pool in the backyard. I've got a daughter and her husband and a grandson living with me. i got five of my kids living within a couple blocks of me. I see my grand... Yeah, I can praise God in anything. I can, I can glorify... God is so good! Amen. Let's not focus on the stub toe. Mm -hmm. Let's not focus on the flat tire. Hey, you got a tire that will go flat. <laughs> and it's on a car! Hey... There's always something to glorify God about. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you glorify God. Look at verse 32. Don't be offensive. Don't be offensive to the Jews. Don't be offensive to the Gentiles. Don't be offensive to the church. Notice. Don't be offensive to anyone. Present yourself with godly love and concern. Well, some people disagree with you. Might somebody even get upset with you? Yes, but don't think, don't go on to Facebook and Twitter and post stuff and say stuff that you know people are just going to get cheesed about. <laughs> now, if you say, I like Obama or I like Trump, will the other side be upset? <laughs> okay, fine. It doesn't mean I have to have 75 posts about how I don't like somebody. <laughs> who cares who you like or don't? Okay? The fact of the matter is, get this, Trump or Obama, I don't like or dislike either one of them. I don't know them. Can I biblically agree or disagree with a policy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make sure my likes and dislikes are biblically based. Not personal, I don't like that. Because you're always going to have likes and dislikes because, hey, you know, you for Ohio State, I don't like you. No, oh, root for Ohio State, I don't care. So you're an idiot. <laughs> okay. Okay. Look what it says there, verse 33. Paul writes in Church of Corinth, and he finishes the book. Don't be offensive. Then he says, Even as I please all men in all things, I try my best to make sure I am acceptable to everybody. I don't seek my own profit, but the profit of others. I want them to go to heaven. How I think about this ain't important. Personal does not mean important. Make sure it's God. Will. Why am I looking for the prophet of any? That they might be saved. Will I see you in heaven? That's the important thing. Well, that's the end of my challenge. We're going to finish with a song. But are there any comments or questions on the challenge? Seeing none, then, turn in your book to page 809. Page 809. And as we sing, I'm going to encourage you to join me on the chorus. Because when we sing through the verse, I'm going to sing it a little bit differently than it's written. Okay? So you sing with me on the chorus. Let's see how many times it Okay. My heart can sing with my cause to remember. Oh. 
Yes. Yeah.